Dire Straits there and the Sultans of Swing. Let's change the mood completely now. Just coming up to 10 minutes to 10 o'clock on the Roman Collins Music Show, here's Linda Ronstadt with the Nelson Riddle Orchestra. Okay, then, Paddy, what's next on the schedule? Give us the, uh, take us up to a commercial break next and then take another disc and that should get us up to near the 10 o'clock news heads. And my blue. Patty Glacken's present job as a radio producer is a far cry from the mountain roads of Donegal. Well, I think it's important to, uh, to stress uh, from the outset that, number one, I'm a musician, and no matter what else I do, be it working in radio or uh, being involved in the National Archive or whatever, it comes from the basis of being a musician first and foremost. Uh, this all started back about 1964 on a trip that my father made with Brandon Bannock up to Donegal uh, to record John Doherty. And I was only 10 at the time, and I remember very well not being, you know, too aware of actually what was going on. But it wasn't until about, say, two or three years later, as I began to progress myself musically, that I realised the importance of that particular trip. In fact, it goes so far as to say that it was every bit as good as maybe two years in school with the, uh, as regards the impression it left on me at the time. And I became aware then of the value of recording, of old recordings, in other words, to try and maintain the continuity of a music tradition. And from that grew this interest that there should be some sort of central location where musicians can go to hear older music. Before he died in 1985, Brownland Brannock was acknowledged as the greatest authority on traditional music in Ireland, and his commitment to the idea of an archive was a long-standing one. What I was contemplating was a, a national archive of Irish music that would have songs, Irish, English, the music. And there is, I think, a, not a, a case, but there is really a, a narrative necessity, we say, of creating a, an archive of sound. Paddy Glacken's contribution to this idea was helped by his job. I worked uh, for the Arts Council and I came into contact in a real way with Brendan Brannock. And with Brendan, uh, we we formulated this idea that there should be a National Archive. Now I was aware of the fact that Brandon was um, working towards this for a good many years and because of all the red tape and various obstacles that were put in his way, it never actually came to fruition. So when I went into the council, I made it a priority and over a period of about three years, um, we formulated a policy. I got together in an advisory committee. They sat for, for two, three years and eventually uh, made their, their, a 10-point recommendation to the council, which I was very glad that the council accepted. And when I left, after a five-year stint in the Arts Council, I was quite satisfied that the council itself had made a commitment to the foundation of an archive. And indeed, we got cooperation from all the main bodies who were involved in this, plus we also got a commitment from the Arts Council of Northern Ireland. So I'm glad to say, in 1985, the person who took over my role in the Arts Council, Dermot McLaughlin, has brought the idea a stage further. The Arts Council's commitment to the idea of establishing an archive was one thing, but achieving this end was another. Shortage of money meant that the Arts Council's ability to help would have to be limited to a proposal framed in very modest terms if it was to have any chance of acceptance. The initial proposal was for sort of a, the overnight establishment of a national archive. That, that was simply beyond our means. Um, what happened then was, I, I, whenever I took up the job in July 1986, I was, I was talking to various people to see if we could keep, just keep the idea alive and um, from, from discussions uh, a proposal was generated by Harry Bradshaw and Nicholas Carlin for a pilot project over a two year period which would see uh, how feasible it would be to set up an archive. Uh, and the council adopted that proposal uh, because it was very, very well put together. Uh, it was very realistic and we had uh, total confidence in, in the two people involved. That proposal, put together by Harry Bradshaw and Nicholas Carolyn, grew out of their successful radio series, The Irish Phonograph, and they wanted it to have wide appeal. Their, their archive would certainly have to be uh, for, for musicians as much as for academics, and I think it would have a, a pretty major effect on, on revitalising certain elements of the tradition, for example, uh, lo local and regional styles, which you, you are not really accessible these days that much. Um, for example, if someone was particularly interested in, say, folk song in Fermanagh or, or fiddle playing in uh, southwest Donegal or the piping heritage from, from Wexford or, or whatever, um, they, they could go to the archive and get, get access to source materials on that subject. 
So, a start has been made, a premise is found, and Nicholas Carolyn has taken leave from his teaching job. Well, it's, um, it's achieved a surprising amount so far, in view of the fact it's only been in existence for about 15 months. Uh, and Nicholas Carlin has he's got a computer database installed and he's got a fairly large collection, um, mainly consisting of Brendan Brannock's papers. Um, and in fact, I've arranged to meet Paddy Glacken over there this afternoon, so perhaps we might drop over there and see Nicholas and see how he's getting on. Hello, Traditional Music Archive. Oh, hello. Hello, Sean. How are you? Yes, just hold on and ask him. Nicholas, it's John Oak Potts. He wants to see the archives' him. rooms in the Eustace Street headquarters of the Irish yeah, Film yeah, Institute yeah, yeah, are already busy with them. callers Bye. and visitors. Although there's been no official opening, word has got round, and Nicholas and his assistant, Sivnik Unrich, have been kept busy dealing with inquiries and accepting donations of all sorts, manuscripts, photographs, recordings. And, of course, there's the hardware. Computer set up, and we've got all the, the books out of their boxes and up on the shelves here, as you'll see. And uh, what else? Tapes. We've started now on the indexing of, of the, the field tapes, Brendan's field tapes especially, and we're using his uh, index for that, you know, the thematic index. Mm. We couldn't really do it without that. We have the entire Cladda catalogue, for instance, and various donors are bringing in stuff daily. You know, and uh, we've got it all organised over, over here. And there's one particular one, in fact, I just got in earlier last week, uh, that'll interest you two boys with the, the fiddles. Come over this way. Okay. Sure. <laughs> this is a recording of Michael Coleman, a private recording, and uh, he's playing the tar Bolton, as you can hear. And uh, Coleman, of course, was the most influential maker of 78s, or commercial 78s. Not that he was the first uh, Patsy Tui, uh, the piper, uh, made cylinders and indeed uh, some 78s earlier in the century, but Coleman was the most important, the most influential. And he established uh, Sligo music as a standard for all Irish traditional music. Uh, he brought in James Morrison on his coattails and then later again uh, Paddy Killoran and three great uh, Sligo fiddlers. And indeed, uh, to such an extent, were, were they influential that, say, this other man, um, Huey Gillespie, who was a Donegal fiddle player, became a Sligo fiddle player as far as his style went in, in New York. Um, these are just some of the solo players. There's also, of course, a lot of accordion players, flute players and so on. And um, uh, smaller groups then, like the famous Flanagan brothers that were both a, a duet and a trio at another time. And then larger ensembles that were made possible by the invention of electric recording, like um, John McGettigan's Irish Minstrels and uh, other bands like that. But the archive collection also extends well beyond the purest boundaries of Irish music. We don't uh, have a, a narrow definition of, of what traditional music is, and we would uh, encroach very much on what might be regarded as popular music if there's a traditional element. So say if melodies are traditional or if they're modern arrangements, rock, pop rock, pop folk uh, arrangements of uh, traditional material, we would include that. Our aim is to cater for the widest possible uh, interests. In 15 months, long cherished hopes have begun to be realised, but they're built on solid foundations. The collection is basically that of Brendan Brannock, the great expert on Irish traditional music. He accumulated this collection throughout his life and it's the foundation collection of the archive. Um, we have a very large book and printed material holding all the major collections, all the major serials, runs of the major serials, and down to items like school books uh, that were produced for singing classes in the 1920s. Very large range of material. We have also his um, uh, tape recordings uh, as you know, he made a lot of very valuable field recordings, people, important people, now long dead, in fact. Names like Willie Clancy, Dennis Murphy, Seamus Ennis are all represented here. So too is John Doherty, who was such a major influence on both Paddy Glacken and Dermot McLaughlin.
music renewed in young hands. And access to this old music is being helped by the most up-to-date technology. With over 3,078s and some 1,500 LPs of Irish music issued, it can be sometimes very hard to keep track. So how would the computer treat an inquiry about Michael Coleman, for instance? Now, it's told me that we hold information on 21 records of Michael Coleman, so I tell it to display them, and up they come, with Coleman's name highlighted and all the information uh, on the first record, all there on screen. But the processing of information is set aside when visitors come to inquire, especially musicians looking for particular facts or tunes to expand their repertoire. Sean O'Potts is interested in another John Doherty tune. Which I probably would suit you better. So if you just let me check it now. Three, six, five, one. Yep, here we are. Uh, and uh, yeah, Brendan Brannock recorded this in 1964. So oh, I guess you'd like to hear that, oh, would you? Please, yeah. 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 Okay, it's on. It's one of these tapes over here in the shelf. So if we go over, I'll put it on for you. Yeah. 